1950, J. Edgar Hoover had an index of more than 12,000 people whom he proposed be arrested and thrown into military prisons without hearings or trial in the event of a national emergency. By 1953, when I took office, the list had grown to 24,000 people. These are American citizens. And in 1956, Hoover authorized the first of 12 programs known collectively as COINTELPRO, counterintelligence programs. They were aimed at destroying individuals and institutions that he and he alone determined were threats to the United States. This wasn't intelligence in the formal sense of the word. It certainly wasn't law enforcement. It was dirty tricks aimed at harassing people to death with burglaries, poison pen letters, planting evidence, and the targets weren't the sad and pathetic remnants of the Communist Party of the United States. They were people like Martin Luther King. These programs went on until well after Hoover's death. We think of bugging and break-ins with presidential authorizations as something that began under Richard Nixon. It didn't start with Nixon. It started with President Kennedy. The 1960s brought the United States into a state of war at home and abroad. And during those years, Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon used the CIA to spy on Americans and to violate, violate a compact between presidents and the American people. And here are three scenes from those days. It's August 22nd. 1962, in the Oval Office, and the tapes are rolling. <coughs> president Nixon was the only pre wasn't the first president to tape himself. It was President Kennedy. It's a little after 6 p.m. on this August afternoon. President Kennedy is talking to his director of central intelligence, John McCone. How are we doing with that setup on the Baldwin business, he asks. Baldwin was Hanson Baldwin, the national security correspondent for the New York Times. He had published detailed, accurate stories about Soviet nuclear forces, citing the CIA's own intelligence estimates. The setup President Kennedy was describing was a CIA spy force intended to stop the flow of secrets from the government to the newspapers. This is 10 years before the plumbers. The President ordered the CIA to keep watch over five reporters and their sources. And this order remained in effect from 1962 to 1965. He set a president, President Kennedy did, for domestic spying that would be followed by President Johnson, President Nixon, and President George W. Bush. Five years later, it's the fall of 1967, LBJ became convinced as a matter of moral certainty that the American anti-war movement was financed and controlled and directed by the communists in Moscow and Beijing. He ordered his director of central intelligence, Richard Helms, to provide the proof. Helms reminded the president that the CIA was barred from spying on Americans. And Helms said that the president replied, I'm quite aware of that. I want you to hunt down the communists. It is likely that President Johnson expressed himself more forcefully than that, but that's how Helms remembered it. So the CIA undertook in 1967 a domestic surveillance program, codenamed, unfortunately, Operation Chaos. It went on for nearly seven years. How did they choose these names, anyway? <coughs> Helm said it was random. But that's what it was, chaos. The CIA compiled extensive files on 7,200 American citizens and indices on 300,000 American people and organizations. It began working in secret with police departments all over the United States. It was not quite able to draw a clear distinction between the hardcore left and another mother for peace. It spied on every major organization to the left of the Democratic Party of the United States. And at the president's command, issued through Richard Helms, the director of central intelligence, the National Security Agency, created by President Truman in 1952 to conduct electronic eavesdropping overseas, began to train its immense electronic eavesdropping technology on American citizens. And this went on for seven years. And neither the CIA nor the NSA ever produced a shred of the evidence that President Johnson so badly wanted. 
Secret operations tend to take on a life of their own. They just grow, like Topsy. When Richard Nixon came to office, secret government surveillance began to grow until it reached a zenith toward the end of his first term. The president, President Nixon, had a deeply troubled relationship with the Central Intelligence Agency. He believed, as a matter of absolute certainty, that he had lost the 1960 election, not because of Mayor Daley fiddling with the ballots in Cook County, but because the CIA had given President Kennedy inside dope on the imminent Bay of Pigs invasion. And Kennedy had used this to score debating points in the televised debates. This is Richard Helms, the director of Central Intelligence, on the subject of Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon never trusted anybody. Here he had become president of the United States, chief of the executive branch, and yet he was constantly telling people that the Air Force and their bombings in Vietnam couldn't hit their behind with their hand, that the, pres that the State Department was a bunch of pinstripe cocktail drinking diplomats, that the agency couldn't come up with a victory strategy in Vietnam, and on and on and on. The president himself expressed himself even more forcefully. This is a word-for-word -word transcript of President Nixon meeting with his Foreign Intelligence Advisory Board July 18th, 1970. The United States has spent $6 billion on your own intelligence and deserves to get a lot more than it's getting. I will not put up with people lying to me about intelligence. If intelligence is inadequate, if intelligence depicts a bad situation, I want to know about it. And I will not stand being served warped evaluations. I believe that those responsible for the deliberate distortion of intelligence should be fired. The time may be coming when I will have to read the riot act to the entire intelligence community. Thank you. Thank you. I, I am a reporter because of Richard Nixon, and I miss him every day. <laughs> this is George Shultz, later Secretary of State, then Richard Nixon's budget director, talking on the same subject. Oh, Nixon railed against the CIA and their lousy intelligence. He would say to me, I want you to cut the CIA's budget to one-third its present size. No, no, make it one-quarter its present size. It was Nixon's way of venting his ire, Mr. Schultz explained. But Nixon wasn't kidding. He did not trust the Central Intelligence Agency. He did not use the Central Intelligence Agency to gather intelligence. When he and Kissinger went to negotiate with the Russians, with the Chinese, with the North Vietnamese, they didn't tell with the CIA what they were doing. The CIA had no idea what was going on. And it became dysfunctional. Richard Nixon wanted to use it as a secret police. By 1971, the CIA, the NSA, and the FBI were spying on thousands of American citizens. Defense Secretary Terry Melvin Laird, as those of you who came to Mr. Van Atta's talk the other day will, will know, the Defense Secretary Melvin Laird and the Joint Chiefs of Staff were bugging Kissinger. Nixon, had, of course, and Kissinger were wiretapping their own aides, and Nixon had bugged himself. <laughs> Much of this bugging was intended to stop leaks to the press as President Kennedy had intended. But leaks are a spring that faileth not. <laughs> and so when the New York Times began to publish the secret history of the Vietnam War, known as the Pentagon Papers, Nixon and his White House took extreme measures. They hired a washed up CIA officer named Howard Hunt. They sent him back to the agency for eavesdropping gear. They set up a team of ex-CIA officers and, and ex-CIA agents, and they ordered them to break into the headquarters of the Democratic Party at the Watergate Hotel. No one knows why. <laughs> to this day, no one knows why they did that. Of course, they botched the job. J. Edgar Hoover would have known how to handle this. <laughs> but at the time of the break-in, Hoover had been dead for six weeks. <laughs> 